Um, thank you for that kind introduction, and I have to say I'm really honored to be here. I've been trying to get here for a few years and finally have made it. Um, I think this is a great audience for me because this talk was originally developed for um, more of an AI audience and a systems audience. I gave a talk in, uh, in uh, where was I, Sydney on Thursday and Friday. Um, just got back to this country yesterday. Um, and I was really aiming this really for an AI audience to tell them what I think they need to do. So there's a lot more expertise actually in this room given some of the talks we've already seen here from Sheena and others that were awesome. And I hope to get feedback from you on how I can make this better to um, in some ways change the field. So I worked in human computer interaction and ubiquitous computing. And a few years ago I realized I also work in AI. I've worked in applied AI all the way back to my PhD dissertation and many of the things that I've built and worked on since then. And so today I'm going to talk about the intersection between those areas of ubiquitous computing, HCI, and AI, and how I believe we need a more human-centered view of artificial intelligence. And so I believe this is really relevant to many people here because you're thinking about how to analyze and build new AI systems and how they're going to impact society. So we all know AI is taking the world by storm. But it's not yet in this sci-fi future of robots interacting with us. In fact, it's usually today AI making impact by manipulating our network feeds, causing people to feel bad about themselves, or even worse, to be deceived and outraged, even upending democracies all over the world. Or AI is being used to help judges in sentencing um, that it is in a way that is biased by race, as has been shown in studies concerning the COMPASS program. Because of these observed negative social impacts, we've seen a quick proliferation of AI for good initiatives and institutes. This is just a subset, a long list that Ben Schneiderman has um, compiled. And I think there's two main ways that I see most of these types of efforts going. So the first type is really where we have social scientists who often notice and critique the potential harms of AI. And this is very useful, but that doesn't help us apply AI in positive ways. It might avoid some of the problems after the fact, but we want to get to these warnings earlier. How do we proactively design to avoid these issues? The second type of effort, which I think is more common and often fails, is when uh, technologists try to go it alone. So typically, AI experts see an important social impact area like health and apply AI naively so that it doesn't actually work in practice. This has happened repeatedly, but occurred acutely in the short-term crisis of COVID, or long-term, depending how you see it. But it's also occurred repeatedly over the long term. For example, in 2016, Turing Award winner Jeff Hinton said, we should stop training radiologists now, as AI will easily surpass humans within five years. OK, it's been five years. This has not worked out. Not in AI and radiology, not in AI and skin cancer detection, and not AI in several other areas, often due to differences between the ideal data sets that researchers train and test their algorithms on and the messiness of data found in the real, real world hospitals and health clinics. Obviously, there are applications of AI where you can get this right. And folks who have done these things in real companies in the field and iterated have found ways to make this work. But it's still a problem. I would claim a bigger problem, though, is often researchers don't even solve the right problem. So for example, instead of trying to replace radiologists, we might want to have AI systems working in tandem with radiologists to make the technology more useful. Let's augment the radiologists capabilities rather than try to replace them. This recent New York Times opinion piece quotes my Stanford radiology and AI colleague, Kurt Langholz, who writes in one of his papers, will AI replace radiologists is the wrong question. Instead, he wrote, the right answer is radiologists who, will use, who use AI will replace radiologists who don't. So augment that. I believe there's a better way to design AI for positive human impact. This better way is what I term human-centered AI. How do we get the positive outcomes from AI? That is, what would it have taken to have avoided the negative outcomes from Compass's AI-assisted sentencing? To avoid these outcomes, I think we need to design and analyze these systems at these three levels in conjunction. So in terms of the user, the community, and society. 
And to do that, we need to create these systems with interdisciplinary teams from the start. So I want you to imagine your own projects that use AI and how they might change for the better if you leverage these three levels of analysis. I believe that if you do, you will create technology that has a better chance of making a positive impact. So what do I mean by human-centered AI and these levels of analysis? So first, human-centered AI is about the scope of who we study. Who we study to find out our problems, develop our solutions, and evaluate the systems that are a result. To do this, we first need to have a user-centered process. This should be obvious to everyone in this room. This is to integrate well-known techniques from human-computer interaction and design that account for the needs and abilities of end users of computing systems early and often and rapidly iterate and improve the technology through rigorous testing. But we need to go beyond just having a good process. We need to think hard and creatively to develop new designs that augment people by carefully accounting for their cognitive abilities and their existing workflows. And we want to base these on underlying theories that explain why people behave the way they do. This will help us develop systems that work for humans rather than futilely trying to replicate them. But I would say this is not enough either. As has been illustrated by the harmful examples that I mentioned, we can't only design around the user. That would be like designing that sentencing system just for the judge using it, creating a nice UI with some great data analysis, but that may ignore the underlying systemic issues with the system. It would ignore the community that the system impacts, the people who are accused, their families, the lawyers, the victims, their families, the community they come from. We need to understand that community. We need to understand the structural barriers they face, for example, racism, before we can more appropriately design that sentencing system. Maybe some of those people we think about at the community level would actually be the users of the system as well and should be included at that user-centered design level. But even that's not enough. We also need to understand what the impacts are on society at large. What does it mean to have a large percentage of the US population in prison, for example, or even a larger percentage of African American males, or a large percentage of people who are simply caught using illegal drugs? These issues have immense societal impact and high social costs. And we want to have some analysis of what the potential impacts of our new software might be on these questions. So we need to be able to forecast what might happen if this system becomes ubiquitous, because somehow we did so well that it succeeded, and designed to mediate potential societal impacts. Now, I'm not claiming this is easy. In fact, it's very hard, especially for computer scientists. And so that's why it, you need to truly have interdisciplinary teams. So not only technologists and AI experts, but also experts from design experts from the social sciences and humanities, and domain expertise depending on the area you're working in, so such as medicine, law, or environmental science. And these experts need to be true partners from the beginning rather than simply added on towards the end to investigate potential harms. So I want to run you through what this type of analysis might look like for two more examples beyond sentencing. So the first is from the literature and the popular press, and the second's from one of my own research projects. So to review my model so far, human-centered design or human-centered AI in this case requires we have this interdisciplinary team that analyzes the problem at these three levels of user, community, and society simultaneously or at least very close in time. So for example, what does this human-centered analysis look like for autonomous cars in the Ford building? Oh, how appropriate. Um, <laughs> So here's a Tesla with its autopilot feature, and we can you know, talk over dreams tonight whether that's uh, an appropriate name for it. But whether now or in 10 years, autonomous cars will happen. And it's just a question of how much autonomy and where it's used. You can claim it's already here, or it's not here, or will never be here, depending what you want.
But I will claim that what most researchers, researchers have done previously and now what car companies have done as well is primarily look at this user-centered level, looking at the driver, what the driver might see on their display, such as this large display in the center console of a Tesla. Or more importantly, what the driver sees when in autopilot mode here behind the steering wheel. What should it show or how should we get the attention of the driver when the system is less sure? Less sure about what other cars and other drivers are doing. Less sure for the, of its performance in inclement weather. Or less sure of an area that it's in, an area that might not have been mapped recently. That's all at the driver level. But these other levels of analysis are quite important to solving or even, I would claim, posing the right problem. If we think about design, it's really about problem finding more than problem solving. At the community level, we care about other drivers, whether in autonomous cars or non-autonomous cars. Some of the early mistakes you see in this is drivers see an autonomous car and they behave very differently than they would previously. We care about studying interactions with pedestrians and bicyclists. These have all been afterthoughts in these efforts and have led to many of the problems that might have been avoided if they had been considered much earlier on in the conception of autonomous driving. Finally, at the society level, we need to consider the impacts on a city or on a region. Maybe the impacts are not as positive as enthusiasts might lead you to believe. Some studies have shown that autonomous cars will lead to more traffic and more deaths due to people driving more miles, living further away, and sending cars around empty. Hey, I don't want to park at Northwestern. That's too expensive. I'll send it off to this lot outside of town. Okay? These aren't just newspaper headlines, but are based on solid research, for example, by transportation researcher experts at the University of Texas, who found, at least in the Texas Triangle Mega Region, as they call it, um, <laughs> which is Austin, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio. And I'm always like, that's four cities, so they must be on a line somewhere there. <laughs> um, um, autonomous cars will likely swamp traffic due to the changes that these AI-based cars will bring in terms of people's behavior. With this type of analysis from the start, we might decide our social resources might be, or societal resources might be better spent on building a better public transit system. If we only analyze and design at this user-centered level, the level that most of us in HCI, but not all you great community researchers there, but many of us, <laughs> um, if we only start at that level, we may ignore these important questions until it's too late. So I don't want to give you the impression that there's no related work in this area. Um, in fact, first of all, HCI and design have been working at the at least the user-centered level for 50 years. And there's many, many known techniques. And there's great newer work trying to apply these kind of techniques specifically to AI. So for example, this good paper by Salim Armeshi at Microsoft and colleagues at Microsoft and University of Washington a few years ago in Kai was quite good. At the community level, you know, again, there's well-known techniques for many years. For example, value-sensitive design developed by Bacha Friedman and colleagues at the University of Washington helps designers really find what the particular values are of their users and be explicit about them in design rather than just relying on the embedded values of the designers themselves. And there's new ideas such as design justice by Costanza Chok. And then at the society level, I feel there's less well-known techniques on how to use that in design of systems. But there's definitely good recent work pointing out what some of the problems are with these type of systems. So for example, Safia Noble's book, Algorithms of Oppression. One of the key research questions for me is how do we integrate these kind of ideas into a coherent process that design teams could actually use to do better and create human-centered AI? So due to the recognition of the negative impacts of AI, we recently started a new institute at Stanford to study human-centered AI. It's actually three years now, but I'm compressing it in COVID time. Um, I'm one of the co-founders and recently became the vice director of this. And although HAI's goals are wide-ranging, they're really anchored in three basic tenets that suffuse everything we do. And these were really laid down at the start. So first, we believe that AI should be inspired by human intelligence. 
This is more about the algorithm. So we should strive to learn all the ways we can from the nature of the human brain and the nature of human behavior to help us, help us determine where AI should go next beyond deep learning. What's next in AI at the algorithmic level? Second, we believe that AI needs to be guided by concern for its impact on human society. Given how potent it is and considering all the effects after the fact, this won't work. So we need to be considering before, during, and after. And as some people mentioned in the last session, maybe even not developed sometimes, though I would claim that's easier to say than done. And then third, we believe that AI should augment, not replace human capabilities. This is more about what is our design stance and how we design for AI. With proper guidance, we believe AI can enhance the qualities about what make, the qualities that make us human. So one of our early innovations here has been the sponsorship of an ethics and society review process. This was really started in response to the US IRB. So as everyone in this room has probably ever gone through, you go through your IRB process to protect your human subjects and your studies. But that's about the risk to those subjects, not the risk to human society. In fact, IRB even excludes doing the later. So ESR is this institutional process started by Michael Bernstein and Margaret Levy at Stanford that facilitates researchers in trying to think about and mitigate negative ethical and societal impacts of their AI research. It acts as a gate to access HAI funding. So we give out about four to five million dollars per year on the Stanford campus in research funding. But to get that, people have to have gone through this review process. So they write a research proposal as normal, and luckily for these internal grants, those are you know, two or three pages. And then they have an additional page, which is an ethics and society review statement. So all of the proposals that get through the normal merit review, then go to the ESR committee that has expertise on this topic. And then some of them will just be like, yeah, that looks good. And about a third of them, they might have an easy back and forth of some questions. And then there's 20 to 30% where there might be multiple rounds of trying to get at things that might change the proposal or be strongly advised they really need a different type of expertise on their team. And then eventually, if they're approved, um, they get through to the funding. You can read about it, and uh, Michael has a paper in PNAS. So even with this ESR process, and the three tenets of HAI, I recently concluded that three years into this institute, we didn't even know what human-centered AI meant or how to achieve it. So I found that it really meant whatever, it, whatever someone wanted to bring from their own background. You know, for AI people, it just meant, I'm working on something that has a societal impact. I'm glad, OK? Um, <laughs> All right, so I, I really wanted to think about it more directly and think about you know, how we might develop a process so that AI projects could be human-centered. And that's where the ideas in this first part of the talk come from. So now that I've given you an idea of what human-centered AI is, I'd like to take you through one of my own research projects that uses AI and show you where it's human-centered and also where I think we can do better. So I'm going to critique my own work, not just some random people who develop systems that I don't even know. Um, and I think that this human-centered lens that I just presented to you is changing this project um, for the better after some early missteps. And I'll take credit as one of the leaders for all the missteps. OK, so the motivation for our hybrid physical digital spaces project is that Many Americans, I don't know about people in this audience, are overstressed, inactive, wasteful, uninspired, and feeling isolated in their work or schools. Sounds like a downer. Um, <laughs> maybe we should start projects like that, but whatever. <laughs> they gave us the money. Um, we also observed that people spend much of their time inside the built environment with these afflictions. 87% of our time according to the EPA. <laughs> and there's growing awareness that our time spent in buildings can ne negatively impact our wellness. But the science behind that awareness and the recommended strategies to improve the situation are actually quite thin. And this really surprised me when we started the project. I expected, oh, the architects and the civil engineers, you've all done these studies, and you know like what this natural light does to us and all this. Um, 
And you know what? They really haven't done a lot of that. You won't find a lot of great research there. So we were really interested in how can we build up a science to understand how buildings affect people? And how could we redesign spaces based on that science to account for these understandings? And then finally, from you know, my user-centered HCI view, it was how do we design systems that could sense our afflictions and then adapt that environment dynamically to uh, improve our health and wellness? So those were the basic ideas. We did the first thing right. We started out with this great interdisciplinary team that includes expertise in buildings and architecture, in computing, including HCI, security, and AI, and then real experts in people. So we have folks in psychology, health, privacy and law, education, and even organizational behavior. And they all had a passion for creating a better built environment. But we were not using this human-centered AI lens when we started this project. And as I said, I'll admit as the HCI person, I was very focused on this user-centered level, okay? Let me build my ambient display on a wall. <laughs> but I'm gonna use this human-centered AI lens now as I go through the pieces of the project to illustrate where some of the gaps might be. So just to give you a little more of the background, we based our initial ideas on a model that illustrates how building features, individual outcomes, organizational outcomes, and societal outcomes are all linked. By building features, we mean things about the design and construction, and, but also the user experience. So think about how noisy is it? Is there access to natural light? This room is actually quite good in this way. What type of materials are used? Is there access to nature? If these are negative, like I've shown in this example, they can lead to bad individual outcomes like stress, anxiety, and distraction. That's at the user-centered level. That, in turn, can lead to organizational or community outcomes such as a lack of productivity or waste or a sense of lack of belonging in the organization. And then finally, those community and organizational outcomes have impact at a societal level. So on our economy, on our environment, our health and well-being. So at least we were thinking about these three levels at the start. In fact, this slide is from the original pitch deck for this thing. So one of the early things we do in my research group when starting a big project is we step back and we make a vision video. So writing the script, shooting it, and then showing it to people gives you a good amount of feedback before investing years of work designing and building a complex new system. So I'm going to play the vision video for you now. This was made probably five summers ago by some summer undergraduate interns that I had who were probably mad at me when I said, oh, you're going to spend the summer. You're going to make a video, not you're going to build some new system. Um, Again, this is just what our initial ideas were, and it was a way to explore it. This is not what we were even committed to doing by the end of that process. <laughs> okay, let's see if this works. Okay, so imagine an office in the future where digital ambient displays on the wall encourage a team to get more exercise. Maybe by taking the stairs instead of the elevator and also saving the building some energy. Or imagine where we could personalize the temperature for different individuals so some aren't too cold and some aren't too hot or where we could actively cancel noise so that open floor plan offices aren't so disruptive to work in. Or where we can detect the stress of a worker and adapt their space to have more natural scenery, lower the lights, and change the music to reduce their stress. Imagine we could use digital art built into the walls or windows to encourage people to meet others that they haven't met before. Or even to go outside 
which clearly we can do here too. Okay, so this was joint project with HCI and civil engineering and all these other uh, fields that I told you about. So this is a vision of the future where buildings and people interact in a way that proactively shapes our health and well-being. But I'll admit, it's a very techno-optimistic future. How, how would we even get to this future? So what's gone on so far? There is a nascent well-building movement, similar to the earlier kind of environmental building movement that's characterized by things like you know, LEED certification. What's been done in that field so far? So as I mentioned to you, the studies in that field behind the well-building movement are really small scale. Um, they tend to also be short term with limited populations and are primarily based on self-report. So the typical study looks like this. You're in your old building and you're moving to this nice new space that you've gotten. And about a month before you move, you fill out a bunch of surveys. And then a month after you're in the new space, you fill out some more surveys. And that's the research. Okay, That's very typical of this type of field. So we're taking a more integrated and scientific approach. Our first step is to establish the science and understand how these building attributes affect occupant states and do this in naturalistic settings over long periods. We also wanted to develop an infrastructure so other researchers could do that in different spaces than we had available to us. We also wanted to design adaptations, including dynamic ones, to support well-being. But before we could create and deploy any of these new technologies, we need to understand what type of sensing and data collection people are willing to work with and which they prefer not to have in their environments. I'll discuss these three issues in turn. So after doing some preliminary online experiments, which I was pretty surprised to get um, positive results, um, just looking at pictures and having people imagine themselves in a new space, we ran a year-long controlled lab experiment on the Stanford campus with over 400 people. We had two identical offices except I literally paid some guy to build a wall across the windows in one of them. And we systematically varied these building features, such as natural or artificial materials. So this kind of white laminate furniture, although it's in front of you, versus you know, nice wood like on this wall over here. Um, we um, systematically varied the access to natural light or being able to see nature with that wall. And then we also, um, varied images on the wall that you can see here that had either um, a bunch of old white guys or more diverse individuals, okay? So those are the conditions. We had participants wear Empatica watches for electrodermal activity, which is a way of measuring stress, as well as Apple watches. And we used a bunch of standard uh, surveys on stress, belonging, and a creativity task. And by the way, we had to stress them out. So in the middle of this, we told them, Oh, you're gonna, you have two minutes to prepare. You're going to have to give a talk on your positive and negative characteristics of you. And um, <laughs> so, see what happened here. Oh, yeah, of course, IRB approved, yes. <laughs> so, I'm just going to show you the biggest results. So, the condition with natural materials was the biggest factor in terms of effects here. It helped decrease the stress in the participants. This is um, based on self-report. But here you see, based on electrodermal activity, the people in the natural materials have a, a lower peak and they recover more quickly. Participants exposed to the windows also had lower negative stress impacts as well, just not quite as big as what we see here. So as we run these types of experiments in more naturalistic settings, this is just somebody being in one of these offices for an hour. We want to really see what happens over weeks or months. Um, we need to use more sophisticated methods to measure our outcomes more automatically. So we want to, we're focused on these five outcomes of stress, belonging, creativity, physical activity, and environmental behavior. We were intentional not to explore productivity, both as it's one metric that has been explored, but also to introduce the serious concerns of management using such systems to create negative working conditions. So think about an Amazon warehouse where workers who are not meeting their quotas are are fired, and we just didn't want to support that from the start. But how are we going to do this? So we start with self-report, and although I criticized self-report earlier, we're trying to move beyond those kind of surveys that were done in the past and use experience sampling method where we can ask you know, a short question like, how stressed are you on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, maybe five or six times a day, depending on the length of the study. And many re other researchers have shown that this can really reliably uh, measure things like stress. 
We also take advantage of all those building sensors that have been put in for security and environmental reasons, and they can tell us how many people are in a room or how much um, um, energy use or recycling or waste has been generated in a space. And then finally, we're going to get a lot of the data by leveraging the personal devices and sensors that people are already wearing or carrying um, in their watches, phones, and laptops. And these devices really let us get at activity and stress through more physiological sensing. I don't have time to go into techniques there, but there's a lot of different things that have been done um, over the last 10 years where you can really get at, for example, stress even from like mouse movements on a computer. So by triangulating with ESM, building sensors, and personal devices, we have a strong basis to make conclusions about how a particular building feature that we're varying is causing the outcome that we're measuring. Now, after we have reliable systems that can sense occupant states, we'll design and install digital adaptations that can change people's behavior and hopefully improve their wellness. So digital adaptations we're considering could be things all the way from ambient murals in public spaces to something that you might just see on your phone or watch. So imagine this wall here where the pedals are blowing down the wall in this direction. And that might encourage me to walk this way to see where's this stuff going. And what do you know, that's where the stairs are and the elevator's that way. So maybe I'm more likely to take the stairs. Or maybe this is where that new employee that joined last week sits that way and I might just more likely run into them and meet this person who I haven't met before. So that's one type of intervention, but there's many different things we could design and test. Now, because this type of data we're using is highly personal and potentially really sensitive, it's important for us to include both technical and non-technical approaches to privacy and security. So privacy has been part of our research agenda from the start of the project. You know, obviously we want to assess people's comfort levels collecting this type of data. We want to explore how people could communicate their privacy preferences to the building. And all the studies that we've done are opt-in. And we have to have ways for people to view and delete their data as part of the design. And finally, you need to take security seriously, secure the data, and restrict analysis to those who have a need to know. But I would claim that this is really just a user-centered view of design. There's maybe a tiny bit of community-centered in terms of thinking about opt-in or thinking about, hey, what if a random person walks into the building? How do we make sure they know what's going on? But for me, I really felt something was missing. So if we think about the features that we saw in the video and those that I've shown <coughs> since, shown you since and see what levels we're designing at. At the user-centered level, we're mainly talking about building residents who would want these features for themselves. So features that might encourage getting more exercise or sense and adapt to their stress or keeping their data private, as I said, was on our mind from the start. At the community level, we were thinking about you know, helping people meet new people to build community and maybe protect the privacy of these folks wandering into the building. But that was about it. That was about the most that we had really considered. And at the society-centered level, we weren't really considering much. I mean, I mentioned the economy and public health, but we weren't really doing research in those areas per se. Um, those were useful in setting up the project. We weren't really thinking about the social impacts of a building like this, or if these types of buildings were ubiquitous and common everywhere. So how might we get at the community-centered and society-centered issues now? I want to show you some of our newer research that I think was in response to this lack, though before I you know, started to think about it in the way I'm talking about it today, to get a better understanding of these levels. So this uneasiness with the privacy implications led us to develop and run several design workshops. This was a participatory <coughs> technique. These workshops helped us to do more of this community-based analysis um, that the project had been missing. We've now run the workshops with over 100 participants, over five iterations. They're an all-day workshop. Um, we haven't published a paper on this yet. There are some key questions that remain. For example, how do you evaluate a workshop? Maybe I'll get some help from the experts that I see in the audience. Um, we're still working on how we might present that. But one of the big issues in these kind of smart spaces is how to communicate to individual users and the community about what is happening in a smart space. What data is being tracked and how is it being used? So a big part of our 
workshop was focused on how to communicate these issues to people who are using our hybrid physical and digital spaces. So one way products communicate these issues today is by using privacy policies. But these policies, as most of you know, are useless. At left is an art piece where the artist has printed out real privacy policies. These are from products that you use every day. Nobody reads them. How many of, how many of you read these? This might be a weird crowd. No, not that many. There's usually one or two, OK? I know Darren reads them, but um, OK? These are purely a legal construct. They're to protect the companies that write them from lawsuits. They aren't meant to communicate to you what's really going on with the product. Instead, we're looking for another way to communicate what is going on in the building. So we've been developing this idea of implication design. This is where we try to embed a product's ethical implications directly into its design. For example, this ICAM here um, by these other authors is shaped like a creepy human eye. You really know it's watching you, right? So this is a form of communication. You know what's going on. It's, it is not ambiguous. Now, there's, more, there's like other examples of this in the market today that are a little more subtle. But most of these interventions don't quite communicate the extent of the threat. So for example, this little orange dot on your phone indicates that it's recording. But this is only a first step. We believe that through speculative design, we can both imagine ways of communicating the threat, and especially the extent of that threat through imagining alternative communication methods. So let's look at another example of a speculative artifact that might make this more obvious. So I don't know if you've seen this one. This one's called the Parasite. You put it on your smart speaker, and it only unlocks when you give the keyword that you've defined. So you're assured that Google, Amazon, or Apple are not listening into your conversations. It protects you, and it communicates to you. Um, and we'd like to combine these ideas, communication protection and implication design. So what does our workshop look like? A key idea is that the participants are first diverse in terms of domain knowledge, so technologists, designers, domain-specific experts, but also diverse in terms of lived experience. And the single-day workshops, lightweight and easy for everyone to participate in. Others we showed it to have wanted to kind of copy the structure for other domains, and so we're trying to document it better for others. It has three rounds that are structured by using a deck of cards where participants first anticipate positive and negative outcomes in different scenarios and they build these cards. Second, they prototype potential designs for communicating or mediating the implications of anticipated threats. And third, they play a role-playing game where groups try to pose a potential threat from the deck and then are paired with teams that try to design use the design artifacts to counter the threat. So here are some of the artifacts that have come out of the workshops. Um, at top is an uncertainty communicator. The idea here was to surface how uncertain the system was about an inference. The one below it is an on, anonymity bracelet that can anonymize the where is collected information. These are not meant to be designs for products, but our artifacts are what might be termed experience prototypes that can be used to spark further design. And, and they were also limited, besides by the time, by just the materials that we gave out in these workshops. But at this point in time, I think we haven't done enough of this. We haven't explored enough implication design to test with a community in a real space. And we haven't even touched on the societal implications of buildings that collect this type of data about their occupants. So if I use my human-centered AI analysis at all three levels in the HPDS case, it might look something like this. At the user-centered level, we work with and design for the building managers, the building residents, the companies that lease the space and the building owners. At the community center level, we need to work with anyone who might come into the building, or even the neighbors, or the guy selling tacos out front, I wish. Um, and at the, society letter, at the society center level, we need to carefully analyze how this system impacts many different groups, but in particular, people with disabilities or other marginalized identities that may not wish to disclose those to others. It also raises general questions of privilege in society. Who has access to these fancy health-shaping buildings and who does not? And what happens if these buildings are used for workplace surveillance? How do we design to avoid this? And how does it start to change the idea of what work looks like? 
So far, we focused on these low, lower portions of the three levels of analysis. But the questions I've raised at the society-centered level of analysis imply that this analysis must analyze questions of power, which is often left out of technology research. If the decision makers decide to prioritize user-centered design for the managers over the community-centered design for the workers, surveillance state buildings is what will result. And so how do we avoid that? So this recognition of power reminds me of a great talk I saw earlier this month. I've been traveling quite a bit by Ibram X. Kendi, the well-known author and MacArthur winner. And he spoke in conversation with Crystal Williams, the new president of the Rhode Island School of Design. And President Williams asked him, what can artists and designers do in creating an anti-racist society? And I was just blown away by Ibram X. Kendi that I was just like typing on my phone as I went. And he said, what is missing is an analysis of power, bringing an understanding to people about power. We live in a moment when different identity groups are advocating for their rights, their power, their presence, and pushing it back against ways they've been degraded. What is missing are the bridges of solidarity. We need to constantly be building these bridges. Historically, you know who has built these bridges? Artists and designers. I hope to take motivation from this quote going forward on that project that I just showed you to do better at looking at that power. And what I want you to take away from this discussion is that there are many great applications where we can use AI to help people be better at their tasks, to augment them to be better learners, better designers, or take better care of their body. The key is to keep users, communities, and society's needs at the center of these smart interface designs. We're in the early days of finding the right metaphors to allow users to understand what these smart systems are doing and how to best interact with them. And for designers, we're in the early day, days of finding the right processes and tools to practice true human-centered AI. I'm laying out, laying out a plan where I think we can start. If we want positive outcomes from an AI, we need to design and analyze these systems at the three levels I've talked about, the user, the community, and society. And we need to create these systems from the start with interdisciplinary teams. So picture using these ideas in your own AI projects. If you lever leverage these three different levels of analysis, I think you'll create technologies that have a better chance of succeeding and a better chance of having a positive impact. Again, these are really new ideas for me. I just created this talk in the last few weeks, and I appreciate your comments on how we might make this work better. Thank you.